So are we good to start our session? I guess I am audible and visible to everyone. Sir and ma'am, are we good to start? Hmm. Just start the workshop also. Yes. So, ma'am, uh, can we start our session, ma'am? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, we can start. Okay. 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 So, good evening and welcome to one and all. I'm Shweta from Clarnet, a designated session assistant for a seamless experience of the session. Clarnet is very proud to be a digital partner for this event organized by Oncology and Kiriti Society. And today's session is on axillary management in breast cancer upfront and after initiative. Clarnet is India's most trusted and widely used digital platform with multiple enriching services exclusively for doctors. So, let's begin today's session for which I would like to hand over this session to Dr. Chatur Dipi Chatur Vidima. So, over to you. You, ma'am, kindly proceed, ma'am. Okay, here's a big correction. We are having two topics today. So first, I would like to say hello and welcome to all for this next episode of the Oncology Integrated Cancer Webinar Series. This It's a really a great honor and a proud privilege for us to host this webinar from the ages of OIS and supported by Dr. Chaturvedi Cancer Hospital and Clarinet team. Today we are having two great eminent speakers, Dr. Sneha Brua and Dr. Vedant Kabra, to talk on screening, breast screening and treating breast cancers respectively. The questions can be put in the chat box. They will be answered at the end of the session. And so with all this, no further ado, we will start with the lighting of the lamp. And for that, we'll call upon ma'am, Dr. Sneha, and special dignitaries, Dr. <coughs> Vedan Kavra, Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi, to please come forward for the lighting of lamp. <coughs> yes, uh, clarinet team, please go ahead and make it a full size. Thank you so much. And uh, Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi. Hello. Yeah, can I proceed? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead with that. So <clears throat> I'll call the backbone of the Oncology Integrated Society, Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi, who has done his MBBS, MBB, MD from MGM Medical College, Indore, in radiation oncology. And he's a owner of Dr. Shaturvedi Cancer Hospital and RI Private Limited, Basharatpur, Gorakhpur. He has been the past president of UPARI and he has taken special training at Memorial Sloan Catering Cancer Center, New York, New York, USA, Christie Hospital and Radium Institute, Manchester, UK, Royal Wanford Hospital, Exeter, UK. Dr. Daniel Old Cancer Center, Rotterdam, Holland, and has been co guide to many cancer theses of BRD, Gorakhpur. He has had many awards and papers to his publication. He has also been crowned with the Enik Jagran Award and Star of Gorakhpur Award. Over to you, Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi, to give a brief about 
the topic breast cancer screening and the data and why is it important thank you dr deepthi as you know carcinoma breast is number one cancer in females and in india more than 1.68 lakhs newly cases are diagnosed out of which nearly 87000 uh, they die every year not out of it but uh, they every year the death rate is 86 87000 breast cancer cannot be prevented as such if it has to happen it will happen but there are certain things by which we can improve the survival we can save the woman from death and the death rate can come down and the woman can lead a nice life healthy life as a normal person so today for discussing these things we have organized this webinar and for that we have invited dr sneha buyar for uh, judicious use of the screening tools for evaluation of carcinoma breast. Dr. Sneha Bhuyar is MBBS MD, Pune, FICMCH, FICOG, and she is a practicing obstetrician with 31 years of experience. She, is, uh, chair, she was chairperson of Foxy Breast Committee, 1921. GCMI COG 21 to 22, AMOGS MD Chairperson 22 to 24, CEFOG work, Working Group Member on Breastfeeding, <coughs> Founder President ISOPAR, Vidar Chapter President YOGS 2007 and 2008, Study on Female Breast Disease Committee, FOGC. 2019 to 21, GCM, ICOG, National Adolescent Trainer, WHO, FPAI, Sprite, National Expert, UNICEF, AMO, GS, Chairperson, Medical Disorders Committee, Founder, Clinical Secretary, YOGS, 2003, Peer Reviewer of GOGI. She has got many awards. International MS Signature Award for Phenomenal Leadership 2020, Asia GCC Award 2021, Dr. S.N. Malhotra Individual National Award for Outstanding Work in Rural Obstetrics 2008, Dr. Duru Distinguished Community Service National Individual Award 22, Dr. Anandi Joshi State Award by Government of Maharashtra, Lokmat Healthcare Excellence Award 2020, more than 300 talks, 10 plus keynotes and orations and moderate moderator in different panels, more 30 plus chapters and articles in national publications. So she, is, she will be delivering her talk on judicious use of screening tools for early diagnosis of breast cancer. I can. So Dr. Sneha Buya. Sir, thank yeah. you so much uh, for that kind and generous introduction, I would say. Uh, with this, I just uh, start sharing my screen. Uh, and uh, I hope you can see my screen. Yeah. yeah. So uh, without much ado, I would just uh, straightway go to my topic that uh, breast cancer um, it is, you know, why are we gynecologists discussing breast cancer? So first and foremost, it is one of the two leading causes of deaths in women, not only in India, but across the globe. Uh, as all of you are aware that uh, maybe uh, around two decades ago, cervical cancer was the number one killer of the women. But because of the availability of HPV vaccination, it can be prevented. And also because of the wide awareness, the public awareness and the organized screening strategy by the government and non-government organizations it has been you know, diagnosed early. And because of the effective referral system, it has been managed fantastically. 
still it has not achieved the goal, but still uh, at least breast cancer has become number one. As Dr. Chaturvedi has rightly said that it cannot be prevented. We have to just make the women aware and we have to actually tell them what are the uh, symptoms and signs and how they can go for the various screening uh, tests. So because it is becoming the number one killer, and of course, there is a lack of awareness, social yeah. and cultural taboos as well. The women, you know, they are resistant to oh, go to the doctor for getting their breast examined and also lack of organized strategies and definitely the effective referral systems as well. It has maintained its number one position. Across the world, it has been observed that the women depend upon their gynecologists for, you know, at least for the problems related to the reproductive organs as well as breasts. And by virtue of their practice, we obstetrician gynecologists, we are well versed with the breastfeeding and the problems associated with breastfeeding. At the same time, the various endocrinological problems like galactoria, mastalgia, also the problems associated with menopausal hormone therapy and the follow-up of treatment of breast cancer. We gynecologists, you know, are concerned with it. And to accomplish this, the American Board of Obstetrician and Gynecologists have provided the guidelines to integrate this basic teaching in the postgraduate curriculum. I'm sure we too, as postgraduates, were not exposed to this training and that's the very reason even in India, it should be integrated in the PG curriculum. So we have to treat breast as our domain, which was actually, so we have to get this back to us. Now, uh, coming back to the basic subject, what is breast cancer? So breast cancer is nothing but the malignancy of the breast and it can uh, happen in the either the milk secreting lobules or the glandular tissue, maybe the milk collecting ducts as well, the tubular structure. It can be in the stroma as well. And why are we concerned so much as just now? Dr. Chaturvedi has also talked about it that according to this 2018 census or statistics, 1,62,468 breast cancer, the cases were diagnosed. If you consider the uh, combined risk, uh, that is uh, 14%, but for women specifically, it is 28%. Um, and if the incidence rises with age, if you look at this uh, graph, at by the age of 20, it is only one out of 1681 uh, females, but at the age of 40, suddenly it rises to one out of 69. And the lifetime risk for breast cancer for every woman is one out of eight. And that's the very reason all of us should be you know, well-versed with this. So we have to understand the basic anatomy of breast and this is the side view where you can see this milk secreting lobules and this white colored tubular structures, the ducts and the intervening stroma. This is the lymphatic drainage of breast and these are the clinically significant lymph nodes where you have the high mid and low axillary lymph nodes and of course the halsets and the internal mammary lymph nodes, not to forget the supraclavicular lymph nodes. Hormones, this is a paradox here. The very hormones, estrogen and progesterone, which are responsible for the feminine development of the breast, they are the culprit for developing this malignancy. So um, we all have the responsibility of screening these women because we can't prevent it. So early detection in a asymptomatic you know, population. Here we have certain... Um, screening strategies. One is the risk screening. That means you have to screen for what the risk factors for this lady. Second is breast screening, the actual examination of the breast. And third is the genetic screening. So you know, how, what are the tools available and how do we use this judiciously? Breast cancer, as uh, we have talked about, that it is very common. And what is this CR results is survival, epidemiology, and end result data. It says that breast cancer five-year survival varies as per the stage of the diagnosis, stage at diagnosis. So if you diagnose it early, that is a local disease, 99% five-year survival. If it spreads to the region, then it is 85%. And when you have a widespread of this malignancy, the five-year survival may be even less than 20%. So we need to do early detection, early diagnosis, and timely and effective um, referral as well as for the management of this. 
So what are the, you know, uh, screening um, tools available? How should we go for the screening of this lady? Screening should, you know, for any screening, how it should be? Uh, it should be done for a symptomatic individual when actually they have no symptoms. The screening test should be very highly specific, um, not to have many false positive. It should be highly sensitive to detect, you know, everything that is not to miss out on any of the patients. And it should be easily acceptable. It should be easily accessible as well as, so that means it should be uh, preferably non-invasive and it should be cost effective. So this is what we label it as, you know, ideal screening test. So cell breast examination, clinical breast examination, and imaging modalities, these are the ones which we have at present. Now, what are the risk factors for breast cancer? That is, we are talking about the risk screening. You have certain non-modifiable and certain modifiable. So for us, the modifiable factors are very important because we can do something for it to modify. So obesity, high BMI, alcohol, smoking, menopausal hormone therapy, uh, combined OC pills, age at first child, if, uh, how it uh, affects, we're going to discuss this later, and the breastfeeding practices. These are the modifiable factors which you can work on. And non-modifiable, that means you are a woman, you are advancing age, uh, and of course, the family history of breast cancer, your mother has it, your sister has it, or maybe personal history. That means you have had a breast cancer in the past in one of the breasts. Early menarche, late menopause, that is the wider exposure of these breasts to the estrogen, increased breast density, uh, the chest irradiation during childhood, and of course, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutation. Uh, so uh, what are the various uh, organization recommendations for breast cancer screening? The guidelines by United States Preventive Services Task Force, American Cancer Society, American College of Obstetrics, uh, American College of Physicians, and American Association of Family Physicians, all of them unanimously say that for an average woman or for a woman who is at average risk, there's no need to screen routinely before the age of 40 years. So there is a uniform uh, you know, statement by all these organizations, but after 40, you should definitely offer them uh, the screening and how you should apply. This is the most accepted and most popular American Cancer Society guidelines that, uh, you know, if you, your woman is an uh, average risk woman, uh, she should mm, start uh, cell breast examination by the age of 20 years. This is optional, but breast clinical examination um, uh, every three yearly from, it should start from the age of 20 years. 40 years onwards, in addition to the cell breast examination, clinical breast examination, you have to offer them mammography. It is optional, but for 45 years onwards, we, were going, we are going to discuss this in detail. It should be annual mammography. But for a high-risk woman, that means with family history or personal history of breast cancer, mammography annually and MRI also should be done right from the age of 30 years or even five years earlier to the relative that is the index case who has died who has been diagnosed with breast cancer so we have to do the start the screening at least five years before the age of diagnosis of that relative now this is just to know you know how the women should be um, they should become aware of this so they should, she can have various symptoms the lumps in breast thickening swelling uh, irritation or dimpling redness you know nipple discharge so um, um, how, what she should look for on inspection, these are the various, you know, conditions she can notice. Now, when and how you should go for self breast examination. Every woman, whether menstruating or non-menstruating, should go for self breast examination. For a menstruating woman, it should be for every monthly, immediately after the week following the menstrual period. For a non-menstruating woman or postmenopausal woman, it should be the first week of every month. That is how they can, you know, definitely fix up the timing. You have to go for inspection and palpation. So she should expose herself in front of the mirror or maybe while having her bath in, uh, under the shower. And she has to start inspecting her. Now uh, she has to uh, inspect with her, both the arms uh, hanging by the side, then raise her both her hand 
uh, head and of course on the west. So what she has to do is she has to look for all these abnormalities what we have discussed earlier and after the inspection um, the, the, she has to also bend down lean forward little and then she has to pull her shoulders and uh, elbow forward with the squeezing a hugging motion so if anything any lump deep seated that can you know stand out once uh, she finishes her inspection then she has to go for palpation that she can do in sitting position or lying down position she can use her right hand for the left breast and left hand for the right breast and right from one end of the breast that is side to side right from axilla to breast side to side or upside down maybe even round, circular or uh, concentric, radial. So that is how she can palpate. So when the patient herself does this examination of inspection, palpation, and then of course, the, if she sees the nipple retraction or nipple discharge, then uh, she has to note for that. So if she does herself, that is uh, cell breast examination, if the clinician does this uh, detailed examination without using any gasset, then we label this as the clinical breast examination. Now, what are the imaging modalities? Right from the good old days where we had uh, only X-ray as an imaging modality, that since then we have conventional mammography, which is still the gold standard for the screening of breast cancer, screening for breast cancer. Digital breast tomosynthesis, contrast enhanced digital mammography, these are the newer developments in uh, this mammography. And then came the ultrasound. So routine ultrasonography, in addition to this, now you have automatic breast ultrasound, contrast enhanced ultrasound, three-dimensional ultrasound, uh, color Doppler, uh, 3D, 4D, color Doppler, power Doppler, and stress elastography, as well as shear wave elastography. Then came the magnetic field um, imaging. And then, of course, magnetic resonance imaging, diffusion weight imaging, um, magnetic resonance elastography <coughs> and magnetic resonance spectroscopy. Gamma radiation nuclear medicine, the single photon spec and PET. So non-ionizing radiation is the latest one with optical imaging and breast microwave imaging. So we have lots and lots of, you know, it's a wide spectrum of choice available, but how to choose the best one? Uh, we have mammography, the well-proven um, imaging modality beyond doubt. It has been also publicized by American Cancer Society. And these are the guidelines that you have to offer mammography to the lady after 40 years. 40 to 44 years of age, you can keep her as optional. But 45 to 54 years, you have to make it mandatory as annual screening. If at all you don't find any abnormality in this 10 years, then of course, 55 years onwards, you can taper it down to every two yearly. Initially, we were doing every yearly. So now you can taper it down to every two yearly. And then of course, maybe uh, as you have saw, as you saw that, you know, the age shows plateau after 70 years. So you may stop screening after the age of 70 or 75 years and or when the life expectancy is less than 10 years. What are the important tips to increase the diagnostic document for this? You have to actually evaluate the positioning, the nipple in profile and all these things. Maintain the standard search pattern and of course compare the current mammogram with the prior one. And that is why even if the patient doesn't have anything, 40 years onwards, we must advise her to go for a baseline mammography. So this is how you assess the glandular fat interface. And of course, this is just a chart I have uh, compiled to sh compare uh, about the modality and the what is the application, the sensitivity and specificity and what are the advantages and disadvantages of different methods. As I have been talking to you that mammography is still the gold standard for screening as well as diagnosis. Um, this sensitivity is 68.3%. Uh, to 83% and the specificity is 90 to 95% very high and that's a very reason we are still continuing with mammography as the gold standard for screening. These are the various uh, screening modalities we have already discussed. The PET and the SPECT, these are the newer ones on the, uh, the armamentary, if at all you have it. What is the advantage of ultrasonography? 
it, especially in young women with dense breast, we do have advantage. It definitely differentiates the morphology of solid and cystic. And of course, when you combine sonography with mammography, the sensitivity rises beyond 95%. Uh, that's a very reason for younger women less than 40 years. And of course, those with dense breast, you have to choose sonography. So sonomammography is now the combined modality which is being used widely. MRI, magnetic resonance imaging, is not recommended routinely as a screening test for an average risk woman. For a high risk woman, definitely annual MRI is uh, recommended. But when sono and mammography both are inconclusive, we have to go for MRI. I have talked to you about all these newer MRI gadgets which are available. So it increases the um, uh, you know, sensitivity in patients with dense breast tissue, perimenopausal um, patients, as well as very young patients. The sensitivity with full-field digital mammography is approximately 70%, which was for digital mammography was 63%, whereas with film screen mammography, it was only 50%. So um, 2D versus 3D mammograms, as the technology advances, definitely the advantages are also, you know, more and more. So um, uh, for uh, tomosynthesis or 3, 3D, you know, the digital mammography or tomosynthesis, um, we have better visualization of dense breast tissue, uh, the clearer margin of the lesions, and also it reduces our callbacks, you know, uh, uh, visualization of fine details as also there. The dose from doing these projection images is similar to that of single view mammogram, but there are with multiple tomographic images. So that is all about imaging. So self breast examination or clinical breast examination and in amongst the imaging modality, the mammography is the gold standard. But nowadays we are combined, we are preferring <coughs> sonomammography. Now when to offer the genetic testing? If at all you have a breast, um, breast cancer in a woman less than 50 years of age, um, if you have uh, breast cancer in women less than 60 years of age with one of the relative having CA colon, CA pancreas or male relative having a breast cancer, then of course we have to go for um, genetic uh, you know, testing as well as a breast cancer developing in a woman after 60 years, which is actually triple negative. So these are the indications uh, for genetic testing, not that every woman who is having breast cancer should be, you know, subjected for um, uh, genetic testing. What we can do as gynecologists, definitely maintain healthy weight. We, we, what we have to advise our patient to maintain healthy weight throughout life. We have to create awareness about breast cancer. So about healthy life, have healthy food, limit your sedentary behavior, be physically active, limit your alcohol and smoking. Get screened at the age of 40 years uh, and elder and earlier if they are, you know, high risk. Of course, elicit the history specifically for cancer risk and detail medical and family history. If you're at risk for this breast cancer, then self-examination, clinical examination by 20 years, get mammography and MRI done as we have talked about earlier. So friends, I just make you think, but are we really vigilant on this? Um, basically, um, because we are, it's not good to blame the government only for not having the organized screening uh, strategies. They are almost non-existing at present, at least in India. But as a responsible citizen, we do have the responsibility of making awareness, lack of, you know, the, even the um, organizing the screening camps and providing all the necessary information and facilities. So um, we have to utilize this window of opportunity as I have already talked to you, that any of these women, they come to you for any of their problems may not be related to exactly to you know, menses and um, the pregnancy, but sometimes they just come to you even for breast problems. Even if they come to you for some other reason, you utilize this window of opportunity, examine her breast. If at all you find anything abnormal, you subject her to further investigations. If at all you diagnose, you refer her timely to the concerned person that is the onco surgeon or breast surgeon. If at all you don't find any abnormality, just train her, teach her what is self-breast examination and you have to advise her that if at all she finds anything abnormal, she has to report to you. So that is how we can, you know, make our women breast aware. 
and definitely that can lead to early diagnosis. So we used to say initially that uh, oh, gynecologists are saviors and early detection saves lives. But I would, uh, um, uh, I will say that early detection not only saves life, but also saves the breast of the patient because all of you are now well convinced that if you diagnose breast cancer early, that is early breast cancer, you can definitely go for conservative breast surgery with oncoplastic procedure. And you not only save the patient's life, but you save her quality of life also. So with this, I thank all of you uh, for having me here and giving me this opportunity to present myself. I thank uh, Dr. Uh, Dipti Chaturvedi and Eki Chaturvedi sir for inviting me here. Um, I, uh, take, um, I, I'm very happy presenting this talk in front of Dr. Vedan Kabra, who is himself a breast surgeon. And I urge all the Foxians to uh, make the women breast aware and utilize this window of opportunity uh, for you know early diagnosis of breast cancer. With this, I request, I make a humble appeal to all of you to uh, support my candidature as Foxy Vice President uh, from West Zone for the upcoming elections in 20, August 24th. And uh, definitely, I just definitely. all of your support. Thank you so much. Yeah, Thank you, Dr. Sneha Bhuya. Thank you for the nice presentation. And uh, uh, if there is any question in the box, very happy Nothing. I would like to just support her by saying that uh, she very nicely said that BRCA testing should not be done to all. And where it should be done, a uh, very nicely she has elaborated things. Uh, very lovely presentation. Thank you and, so much. If at all mm, any question, I'd be happy to answer that. Mm, Thank you so another thing is 50% uh, of the population is coming to gynecologists. Yes. <laughs> Nearly 50%. So they have got very good opportunity to uh, train the person to examine the people and diagnose the breast cancer in early stage so that they can save the female as well as save the organ. They can preserve the breast and the life uh, will be very easy for those women. So thank you, Dr. Sneha Bhuya. Thank you so much for Thank having you, so you on this show. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, and best wishes. Best wishes. Now we have, we have, yeah. Now, after diagnosing the breast, we have come for the management part. And uh, management is by surgery, radiotherapy, and uh, oncology, medical oncology. So now today, lots and lots of uh, discussion has been made how to manage the carcinoma breast so that we can preserve the organ and give the best result for the community. And today uh, we have invited Dr. Vidanta Kabra, who is MSDS, MRCS, FIA, GES. He is Principal Director, Department of Surgical Oncology, Fortis Memorial Hospital, Gurgaon. He is a quite experienced person. Surgical Oncological Training, he has received from TMH from 1999 to 2003. Fellowship and overseas experience is uh, National Cancer Center Singapore in 2005 to 6. Tissue Biobanking course, Belgium 2009. Robotic Surgery Certification, Sunnyvale, USA 2015. He has got many awards. Uh, University Gold Medal, Final MBBS, Best Resident Award, Best Research Paper Award in ASI Con, and Second Best Poster Award in IASO. Academic Activities, Ex-Faculty at Indo-British Breast Oncoplasty Fellowship Course, University of East Anglia, UK. He uh, six books chap uh, six book chapter and several peer reviewed publications, faculty at national and international conferences, surgical oncology experience of 25 years. He has got a quite long experience. So now I invite Dr. Vedant Kavra for axillary management, which is very important in breast cancer, upfront or after NACT. What should we do and what are the results? So Dr. Vedant Kavra, welcome. Welcome for your deliberation. 
Thank you, Dr. Chakravarti, and thank you, Dr. Deepthi, for involving me in this and inviting me for this talk. And uh, I'll just start to share my screen. And then next. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah, but you just enlarge it a bit now. Yeah, yeah, I have, done it, okay. now. I have done it now. Uh, and then before I start my talk on axillary management in breast cancer, either by upfront surgery or after NACT, I would also like to uh, talk about uh, breast cancer screening and the role of gynecologist, which is very important. And and uh, Buyar ma'am has heard me earlier also because she was kind enough to invite me in the breast arm of the FOXI uh, for their national conference to speak on that. And it's it's very important because as Dr. Chaturvedi also mentioned, most of the patients of breast cancer or breast problems come to us through a gynecologist. And it is very important for them to understand, realize uh, the importance of early detection and timely initiation of treatment and referral. And thank you, ma'am, for that. So I will now start with my talk so why why do we make so much noise around axilla? You know, Dr. Chaturvedi just mentioned there are three treatments, surgery, radiation, and medical oncology. And here we are talking about just a small part of the treatment. It's because of this. Although this is an extreme picture, lymphedema, then almost 25 to 30% of our patients do develop lymphedema. And uh, around 5% of them may have severe lymphedema. And this, this happens rarely, but but it's still quite debilitating, which happens to some of the patients. And it restricts our mobility, causes paresthesia, numbness, weakness, shoulder problems. So there are so many things which happen with complete axillary dissection. So there have been attempts to de-escalate axillary surgery and axillary treatment per se, even radiation, uh, for a long, long time. I, I will speak mainly about surgery, but I will also touch upon radiation at uh, wherever it is needed. So it less is more is the new mantra. And how is it more? Because we do less, give the same kind of oncological outcome, but better quality of life. So 1990s was the turning point when the era of SLNB or sentinel lymph node biopsy started. There were multiple trials and the large ones were NACBP, B32, Milan and Albana, which proved the point that sentinel lymph node biopsy is as good as doing a full axillary dissection in a clinically node negative axilla which is pathologically also negative. And then we found the era of avoiding axillary node dissection, even in sentinel node positive patients. And that was 2000s era, and which is still continuing. And finally, in 2010 onwards, we have seen that post chemotherapy sentinel lymph node biopsy has also been introduced because larger number of patients now go for chemotherapy. In fact, I would say more than 50% patients now go for chemotherapy first and then come for surgery for, for various reasons. Even the early disease, especially the HER2 positive and triple negative cancers, they are largely subjected to upfront chemotherapy. And it is very sad if we cannot avoid axillary dissection for them. And I'll show that later. And apart from this, can we avoid axillary surgery altogether? And there are trials both in upfront surgery setting as well as post neoadjuvant setting. There is one trial which I will deliberate a little, little detail, in, uh, uh, which is sound trial because it has published the results also last year only, late last year. So if I come to upfront surgical uh, management, the axillary options, axillary management options are for a clinically N0 axilla, sentinel lymph node biopsy, or in a low resource setting, there is something called low axillary sampling, which is propagated by Tata Memorial Hospital, Mumbai. They have done their own study and they have found it to be equally efficacious to sentinel lymph node biopsy, uh, where they don't need to use a dye. They have a defined boundary in axilla, which they dissect, remove the nodes, and, and if those nodes are negative, they don't need to dissect the remaining axilla. It does not require any nuclear medicine setup or the gamma probe. Or, or the time which is needed for injection and, and all those resources. Now, coming to no, node positive axilla, if it is upfront, then the usual treatment is axillary lymph node dissection, whether it is level one and two, or sometimes going to level three also, if the level three is grossly involved or level one or two is very heavily involved. 
Now, the points of discussion in upfront surgery are if there is a node which is positive on sentinel node biopsy, what do we do? Do we dissect axilla? Do we do something else? And is there a role of no axillary surgery in some of the patients? So, if we find a sentinel lymph node positive by isolated tumor cells or as we call it ITCs or micrometastasis, that is the tumor deposit in the node is only 2 mm or less, then we can safely observe axilla. And there is a large trial which was over 900 patients, IBCSG 2301, which was specifically for micrometastatic uh, disease in the sentinel lymph node biopsy. And they randomized to axillary node dissection versus no further axillary surgery. 91% of the patients had undergone BCS and only 9% were mastectomy. 10-year disease-free survival was no different for a, for a median follow-up of 9.7 years. And axillary recurrence, although, was much lower in uh, axillary lymph node dissection arm and as expected. However, this had not reached statistical significance, largely probably because the number of events were very less. So only one per one patient out of 450 had recurrence in axillary dissection group and five patients in the no axillary surgery group. However, a point to note is 69% of their tumors were less than two centimeters. Only six to eight percent were more than or three or more centimeters. So although they had taken T1, T2 disease, but largely it was restricted to T1, uh, T1 disease. 9% had mastectomy and 95% of the micromets were involving only single node. Out of all of them, 70% had a deposit which was actually less than or up to 1 mm only. So these are the points that we must keep in mind when we are following this trial. Sometimes we find that there are multiple nodes with micrometastatic disease and then we observe axilla may or may not be true as for this trial, but we will show that it is okay to observe them because of other trials that have been done. Coming to macrometastasis, which is more than 2 mm of metastatic deposit in up to two lymph nodes. ECOSOG Z11 trial, which had only BCS, had 891 patients, again a large trial where it was randomized into ALND and no further axillary surgery in up to two macrometastasis, uh, macromets in the lymph node, up to two lymph nodes. However, there are certain criticisms. This trial also showed that there is no difference between the two. Axillary recurrences obviously were higher, but the overall survival, now we have 10-year results and overall survival, disease-free survival uh, were okay, distant disease-free survival. However, this, this trial did not reach the target recruitment. So the power was less. There was imbalance in randomization in favor of sentinel node arm because the ALND group had a higher, no, higher node burden. So the percentage of patients having four or more nodes or three or more nodes positive was higher in the ALND, ALND group. There was high tangent of RT which was given to axilla. So no axillary surgery was actually not no axillary treatment because the, the RT planning was not controlled and it was such that the level one axilla or lower level of axilla did receive significant radiation, which was almost up to therapeutic dose. So it was not observation in true sense. It was actually ALND versus some radiation to axilla. And again, this is also in highly selected group of patients and I'll, I'll talk about it a little later. Another trial, very good trial, large trial, Amaros trial, which was also on T1, T2, N0, clinically N0, where they included both BCS and a significant percent were mastectomy as well, 17%. The randomization was done before SLNB. So only those who were positive on SLN nodes were positive, were further divided into ALND and RT as per the randomization, which was done before the central node biopsy. Primary endpoint was axillary recurrence, which was double at 10 years in the SLNB arm or, or sorry, the radiation arm, but was not statistically significant. Again, because probably very low event rate. But OS and DFS were same at 10 years. If you see five years lymphedema rate, and this was same in, uh, in the previous trial that I spoke about, Acuzog Z11, it was 24.5% in the axillary dissection arm and only up to 12% or to 12 in the radiation arm. Although there is a significant difference in lymphedema, which is one of our targets to achieve in de-escalating axillary surgery, 
there was no difference found in quality of life as far as shoulder movement is concerned or paresthesia is concerned in spite of lymphedema being double the rate with axillary lymph node resection as compared to radiation, axillary radiation. And hence, it is probably that the lymphedema, lymphedema was only mild to moderate in degree and was not hampering the function. Now, there was another issue. At 10 years, the cumulative incidence of second primary cancers was also higher in the radiation arm. So 8.3% in the ALND arm and 12.1% in the radiation arm. Although a good number of patients who underwent ALND also received radiation to the breast because 81%, as you see, 82% uh, were BCS patients. But addition of axillary radiation has probably led to a larger uh, second primary. So these are the points that we must remember before we apply these trials. And this is this is the overall survival in DFS of amyloids. The blue arm, the blue line is for the axillary lymph node dissection, and the red line is for the axillary radiation. So you can see that these lines are going in parallel for first few years, but there is a little separation seen. And in absolute terms, also there is a difference in overall survival of 84.5 versus 81.4, although it hasn't reached statistical significance. But I think we need to have a little longer follow-up to see because many of those patients were low-risk patients and ERPR positive patients were much higher in number. And we all know that the recurrence rates, the local as well as distant recurrences uh, happen even after 10 years. In fact, mostly after 10 years for ERPR strong positive group. So what is my practice? I What I do is I do frozen section routinely, which is not practiced in Western countries, but our patients don't like to be subjected to two different surgeries. So we do frozen section routinely. And if I find micromets in one or two lymph nodes, I will not do any further axillary treatment. If I see one to two lymph nodes showing macrometastasis, then I will be very judicious in applying Z11 or Amaros. And, and very strict criteria should be taken care of. Why? Because the median tumor size in both the trials was 1.7 centimeters. And we all know that our tumor sizes are much, much higher as compared to West. The size of macrometastasis also would matter. We find, sometimes we find nodes which are completely replaced by macrometastasis and they have extra capsular extension or extra nodal extension also. And this was one of the exclusion criteria of Ecozog Z11. So we, we must be very mindful if we find complete replacement of node. It is almost likely, almost always, there is ECE. Then what I also see is how many nodes are positive vis-a-vis -vis number of nodes that I've removed. So suppose I've removed two sentinel nodes and all two, both are positive. I would be reluctant in leaving that axilla, especially when I know about it at the time of surgery on frozen section. However, if I find one out of six nodes, one out of four nodes, or two out of five nodes, I, I may still, if the, if the size of nodal meds is not big, I may leave it for uh, systemic treatment or for axillary treatment. The other issue is, which one do we follow? Whether we follow Z11, suppose I'm doing a breast conservation, all the criteria are met, we follow Z11 or we follow MROs. We radiate axilla or we don't radiate axilla. So that's that's another debate and it has not been answered by these trials. Now, with Abima Cyclib, which is a CDK4 inhibitor, being used for high-risk hormone-positive patients, if we, we don't dissect the axilla, we are missing the info, missing the adequate info because abimacyclib or the like or, or other uh, other drugs are used for four or more positive. And we we know that if we are leaving axilla behind, uh, in spite of central node being positive, we know that almost 20% of them will have further nodes being positive. And if there are more than four, we are going to going to deny our patients. Uh, of the use of abima cyclib. And I think we we'll need to refine the indications further so that we can avoid axillary dissection as well as give them the benefit of appropriate systemic therapy. So these are the finer points which need to be dealt with. Now, upfront surgery, how do we avoid axillary staging altogether? And this is a very interesting trial called SOUND trial, which was sentinel lymph node biopsy versus no axillary surgery in patients with small breast cancer and negative results on ultrasonography of axillary nodes. So there are, there are few criteria and we have to be very careful about it. We know that SLNB is a reliable means to avoid ALND and its morbidity. We have seen from these trials that there is absence of advantage of ALND also 
post SLNB in select patients if one or two nodes are positive. And there is a surgical society, a Society of Surgical Oncologists USA, which gave a choosing wisely statement. And they said for a lady who is more than 70 years, has a T1C tumor, up to T1C tumor, N0 tumor, ER positive, HER2 negative, we can safely avoid axillary surgery. And which is, which is now recommended also. So with that background, we, we have next question. Is axillary surgical staging really needed in a clinically N0? And by clinically N0, I mean clinically not palpable node. And on ultrasound, there is no suspicious node seen. If there is one you know, doubtful node seen, it should be FNSE and proven to be negative. And can imaging replace surgery for reliable axillary staging? And that's a very big question, which I will answer a little later. This is a prospective non-inferiority phase three, one by one randomization involving 18 centers across the continents. Have 1463 women of any age with breast cancer up to two centimeters. So again, the size is only two centimeters and a negative axillary ultrasound was done. Primary endpoint was distant disease-free survival and then there are various secondary endpoints. Those women who were eligible or had to undergo BCS and radiation was always planned. CN0 axilla is necessary. If pre-op axillary ultrasound was not showing any lymph, suspicious lymph node or there was a doubtful node, but FNAC was negative. And there were multiple exclusion criteria like bilateral breast cancer, already having metastasis, there's previous cancer, pregnancy and all. Or, or the patient says, I will not take radiation. So baseline patient and tumor characteristics in both the arms were similar. There was intention to treat analysis in lesser number of patients and it showed that a uh, good number of patients were actually ER positive or negative. And adjuvant systemic therapy and RT were similar in the both arms. So if we don't have the knowledge of uh, nodal status, it really did not affect the choice of systemic therapy here. Median follow-up was 5.7 years and all the primary and secondary endpoints were similar. And you will see these are well-matched patients. This is distant disease-free survival, yellow, uh, yellow line and a greenish line. Uh, it's, it's almost same uh, yellow line is for no SLNB. This is disease-free survival, yellow line for no SLNB, slightly on the lower side, but not statistically significant here. Overall survival, it's almost balanced. But there are certain discussion points. In spite of the fact that we know in Sentinel lymph node group, there were almost 14% nodal involvements, but but still the cumulative axillary recurrence in no surgery arm was 0.4% only. That means it can be taken care of by systemic therapy. So those 14% nodes were, must have been positive in the no sentinel node group as well, but were taken care of by the, uh, by the systemic therapy. But previous trials have also shown that ALND actually did not improve the outcomes much and, and it was more for choosing the therapy. Now, there is, a, there is a problem. In younger patients, nodal status may become significant because according to uh, our expounder, chemo advantage is not ruled out in low or intermediate risk score. So we need to know about the nodal status. And for node positive patients, there is extended hormone therapy or ovarian function suppression is needed. So we might miss that information if we apply this to all our patients who are less than 2 centimeter and clinically nodal. Also, there is now adaptation of radiation therapy based on the nodal status. So, node positive SLNB only, we can give RT and not radiate as we saw in Amaros. If it is a node negative, more than 65 years, some patients may be avoided RT even after BCS. So, that is de-escalation. But unless we are sure of the node negativity, which can only come after SLNB, we cannot de-escalate RT. And then, the big question of reliability on USG to detect model involvement. In a meta-analysis, the sensitivity ranged from 24 to 94%. However, the current study, USG was very meaningful and they did the, the sensitivity was very high. So this meta-analysis probably included older studies also in a very diverse group of studies. So you see this 13.7% to the METs found in sentinel lymph node were micro as well as micro. And it is much lower than the previous SLNB trials where the, the nodal involvement was much higher because those trials were done many years ago, a couple of decades, three decades ago, and the ultrasound was not as good in detecting the abnormal node. 
And if you see in this trial, the extensive nodal involvement also was very less. So extensive means four or more nodes were involved, only in 0.6%. So they had a very good ultrasound. But we have to we have to be sure that we also have that kind of ultrasound endosonologist. Now they were largely low risk patients, and difference might emerge in the long term follow up. We know that this was a median follow up of 5.7 years. So the plan of the investigators is to continue follow up for 10 years to see if this difference, if, if any difference emerges between the two arms. Although the analysis of adjuvant treatment was not the primary endpoint and sample size calculations were not performed for this purpose, both the arms had same adjuvant therapy, but this cannot be extrapolated because this sample size was not calculated for this purpose. Now, the other problem is they had to stop approval a little early because what happened, most of the centers actually embraced the ZOO11 approach. And even if the central node were positive, they were not dissecting the axilla. So they moved on to that rather than not, uh, not doing axillary uh, central lymph node biopsy at all. However, the accrual was only less by 50 patients. So it really did not affect the result in a very big way. They also registered the trial very late. Now all the trials are to be registered on this website, clinicaltrials.gov, but they registered it late, although they say that there was no intention of delay and they had already published uh, a study, where, uh, published, uh, they had a publication which detailed the study schema. So they concluded by saying that omission of axillary surgery was non-inferior to SLNB in women with small breast cancer and negative axillary USG. And it can be safely spared, uh, the axillary surgery can be safely spared when lack of pathological information does not affect the post-op treatment plan. So those patients where we know nodal status is needed, we cannot uh, spare the SLNP. And the authors themselves recommend that it should, it can be used for postmenopausal ladies up to two centimeter primary, ER positive or two negative. And it actually represents almost 25% of breast cancers across the world, which is 500,000 patients, 5 lakh patients. So it can decrease morbidity and there, there can be huge healthcare cost savings. It may not be 25% in our country, maybe 5% up to 10% in some centers, but not beyond that. But still, we can save that. And there are other similar studies going on to avoid any sentinel node biopsy also. And results are awaited for all of them. Now, so my take on sound trial that it is a well-conducted trial. It is a select low patient group undergoing BCS only. The accrual, all, although is incomplete, but the results are compelling. And the other trials may strengthen the conclusions further and they can expand the indications because other trials have actually uh, included larger tumors also. And in Indian context, I already said that the reliability on USG as well as the median tumor size that we get has to be appropriate, which is only a small percentage of patients. Again, the quality of life assessment has not been done. And as in Amaros, although lymphedema was different, quality of life was same. Here, sentinel lymph node biopsy only really does not affect the quality of life much. But unfortunately, none of the current trials have done this assessment. And the newer ones, a uh, couple of them have actually included QL uh, assessment as well. So we can probably apply it to very small tumors, ER positive, HER2 negative, postmenopausal, if you believe your sonologist to be a good one. And long-term follow-up is definitely needed because it is a very low risk group and recurrences may come later. Now coming to new adjuvant chemotherapy, the second part of the talk is, uh, we all know that new adjuvant chemotherapy is a very effective tool and the indications are now broadening, as I said earlier also from locally advanced breast cancers to uh, large operable breast cancers to early breast cancers and in triple negative and HER2 positive. What happens after chemotherapy? The surgery becomes smaller because we have to remove lesser area of the breast if we are doing breast conservation and you, it is equally effective and kinder because uh, sometimes the patients actually uh, are not suitable for breast conservation becomes suitable for breast conservation. And PCR is an important goal and has prognostic importance also, which we can only know if we have given NACT in the upfront setting. And then the, we, have, we know that there are two trials which also say in triple negative as well as HER2 groups respectively, if we are not able to achieve PCR, we have to change therapy after surgery. 
conventional standard of care post NSCT is do axillary node dissection. Whether we do complete or level one and two only depends on the nodal burden. However, there are certain de-escalation strategies and I will talk about all of them. And why SLN? Because we know that NSABP 27 showed that more than 50% of node dissection post chemotherapy were unnecessary because all those nodes were negative. And it can actually go up to three-fourth of the patients who are HER2 positive and they have received anti HER2 therapy in form of trastuzumab or trastuzumab plus pertuzumab. So that is the kind of complete responses that we can get if we are giving upfront chemotherapy. And these patients will undergo axillary dissection and its morbidity unnecessarily. So is there a way of avoiding it and its morbidity and what is the cost we pay for it? Unfortunately, the early trials that were done showed that the sentinel node, bio, sentinel node identification rate was not adequate and it ranged from 63 to 100%. What we accept is only above 90% and very high false negative rate. And what is false negative rate here? That on sentinel node biopsy, we find the node is negative. However, when the axillary dissection was completed, they found that there were nodes outside of sentinel node boundary which were positive. And this was as high as 39%, which is unacceptable. Why? What happens? Why is there a poor identification rate and false negative rate? Because post-chemotherapy, there is alteration of lymphatic drainage. There is fibrosis of lymphatic uh, channels. Uh, the tumor can obstruct the lymphatic channel. And there is apoptosis and fatty degeneration, so which again alters the pathways. And you will see in the lower figure, that's a normal pathway has become blocked by the cancer cells and then newer pathways have opened. So rather than tumor going to the sentinel node first, after chemotherapy, some cells may escape to non-sentinel nodes also. And that is why we may not have a very good false negative rate. So target identification rate should be more than 90% and false negative rate should be kept to less than 10%. And there are various questions that we need to answer. Is it feasible, sentinel lymph node biopsy? Is it safe and what technique to be used? How do we de-escalate when there is a node which is positive before chemotherapy and converts to N0? Can we escalate if it was an N2, N3 node, so heavy nodal burden and converts to N0? And SLNB post LABC, which is locally advanced breast cancer. So these, these tumors may be N1, may be coming to early breast cancers, but locally advanced N2, N3, whether we can do SLNB safely. Axillary surgery versus radiation and de-escalation in post-NSCT negative axilla. Can we avoid SLNB even after chemotherapy? We saw in sound trial that in some patients we can avoid in upfront surgery, but are we able to avoid here? We will see that. And there are many trials. These are prospective studies actually. Four prospective studies for post-NSCT SLNB for nodes which were initially N+. plus. So those patients who had N0 axilla before chemotherapy, there is no question, we will do SLN after chemo. And if you find that those SLNBs are clear, uh, then we won't dissect the axilla. However, there is a slight difference as compared to upfront surgery. Even if we find isolated tumor cells or micromets, we are going to dissect the axilla as of now. Now, this was clinically N0 before chemotherapy, which remains clinically N0 after chemotherapy. Now, what about clinically N+, plus, which becomes N0 after chemotherapy? And these are the trials where you see what they did was to do central node biopsy and also dissect the axilla. And the false negative rates were very high. They were upwards of 10% in all of them. However, they found that if you use two tracer agents, so which usually what we do is central node biopsy by two agents. One is a radioactive agent, the other is a blue dye or ICG. So with one agent, you can see the false negative rate was 20% in one trial, 16% in another trial. It came down to 10.8% and 8.6% in these trials. And the third trial was from 16 to 5.2. At the same time, if we remove more number of lymph nodes, so if you remove only one sentinel lymph node or you find only one sentinel lymph node, the false negative rate is very high as compared to three or more sentinel lymph nodes where the false negative rate comes to less than 10. So the strategies to improve are, we use dual tracer technique. We should aim for three or more nodes. We can use IHC for identification of IDCs or micromets because it has its implications in post-chemo setting. 
And there is another technique called targeted lymphoid biopsy and targeted axillary dissection in N1 to N0 disease. Now, how do we do that? And also, if you see these trials that I showed earlier, only a small percentage in one of them, half of them, and in the other one, only one third of the patients actually had dual tracer and three or more nodes uh, found on sentinel node dissection. Now, what is TLNB? It's targeted lymph node biopsy and targeted axillary dissection. What we do is we mark the lymph node which was positive by a clip before starting chemotherapy. And these marks, these marked nodes can be confirmed radiologically because a clip is there. SLNB is done including enlarged nodes, these clip nodes and SLN. So what is targeted axillary dissection? Targeted lymph node biopsy, which is the clip node. Sentinel lymph node biopsy, which is a sentinel node. And in addition, if you find any enlarged node, this will form targeted axillary dissection. And we, there are various methods of clipping and I will not go into detail. I'll, I'll just go through them fast. You can just have a metallic clip. You can have radioactive iodine, carbon particles, magnetic seeds, and even RFID tags have been used. Of course, they're not available and very expensive. And each one has positives and negatives. So this was MD Anderson's study published in 2016 using targeted axillary dissection. And then there are various more studies which have come there. And they said that marked or clipped nodes was actually not part of sentinel node in 15 to 40% patients and average was around 25. So if we don't clip the node and we just do a sentinel lymph node biopsy, we will miss that node which was initially uh, positive and not remove it. So we should clip it and remove it is what these studies say. This is this is a meta-analysis published in 2022 and which also said that with targeted lymph node biopsy, the identification rate was 93.5% and the false negative rate was only 5.5%, ranging from 33 to 8% in various studies. However, is clipping really needed or mandatory? This is a Memorial Sloan Kettering study, which showed that clipping may not be really needed. What they did was out of 269 patients, without clipping, they identified three or more sentinel nodes in 93% patients. And clip node was sentinel node in 88% of them. So 12% clip node may not have been there. What they found was in the remaining 31, so 220 of 251 had the clip node in the SLN node. In the remaining 31, 13 had SLN positive. So ALND was anyways done and clip was identified. And in out of 18 of 31, where no ALND was done, at median follow-up of 55 months, they did not see any axillary relapse. So what they have said, even without clipping, if you use dual tracer, more than 93% times you are able to identify three sentinel nodes and the false negative rates are going to be acceptable and no detriment in the reasonably long-term follow-up. Can we avoid axillary node dissection in locally advanced breast cancer who is undergoing uh, uh, undergoing chemotherapy? There, are, there is very limited data and there are two studies uh, in India done from TMH and SGPGI and they do say a word of caution uh, TMS study says that we can still safely do uh, low axillary sampling. Um, however, uh, we need to be very cautious if we are offering it to LABC, the frank LABC kind of thing. And then these are some more studies. I'm not going into details of these studies. And now, what is the future of axillary management post NSET? Our aim is, can we avoid ALND in node positive disease, which is don't do axillary dissection, but do radiation instead. Can we avoid axillary treatment altogether in post-chemo N0 axilla and avoiding SLNB in pre-chemo uh, N0 axilla, which converted to clinically negative or which remained clinically negative? Now, there is a first question was axillary surgery versus radiation in a post-chemo axillary node positive. This is TAXIS trial, which is a multicenter randomized phase 3 trial. What they do is they do palpable suspicious nodes, they do remove sentinel nodes, and if they have clipped a node, they will remove that also, which is encouraged. So first two are mandatory, the third one is encouraged. And they confirm that node that the clip is there by specimen radiography also. 
Now here, if they find that the nodes are negative on targeted node dissection, the patient goes off trial. The others are randomized into accelerated node dissection versus radiation. And we hope that we'll have results in a few years. There's another trial which is also studying ALND versus axillary RT and the completion is going to happen this year with results coming later on. One more trial completion date is around 2030. So we have still a long way to go for post-chemotherapy, node positive disease, whether we dissect axilla or we give radiation. Right now, the standard of care is dissect the axilla, whether level 1, 2 or level 1, 2, 3, depending on the nodal bird. So another trial, I'm not going into those details. Now, there are two more trials which are seeing can we omit SLNB altogether in post-NACT setting, which is ASICS trial from Netherlands and UBREST trial is again a European trial, multi-center trial. So these are single arm trials. These are not randomized trials, but they are trying to see if they can avoid SLNB altogether in some patients. So the questions that I raised earlier, and I'm going to answer them based on the data that I have presented. Is SLNB feasible and safe after NACT? Of course, yes. In which patients? DS N0 patients, yes. De-escalation of N1 to N0 conversion, what do we do? We can do a ta targeted axillary dissection or a dual tracer SLNB. An individual institute validation is necessary. So we just cannot embark on these things based on Western data. We have to validate our own data. So for initial few patients, maybe five, 10 patients, 10 patients we see that we have done sentinel node and we have dissected the axilla also. We find that sentinel node was negative and the remaining axilla is also negative. Once we have that confidence on ourselves in identifying the nodes, in our, on our pathologist, in identifying the meds on frozen, we can probably start it for select group of patients. For, for patients who de-escalate from N2, N3 to clinically N0 post-chemotherapy, there is no axillary de-escalation recommended and these patients should undergo an axillary dissection. SLNB post-LABC is not recommended, but low axillary sampling as uh, recommended by TMH may be an option in select patients. Now, axillary surgery versus radiation, the answer is awaited by those trials. Uh, currently, axillary dissection should be continued. De-escalation in post-NFCT negative axilla, Avoiding SLNB altogether. Again, I have mentioned there are ongoing studies and we will see uh, what they show. So, so now the summary point is that it is important to stage axilla and also for local regional control because we have seen in all the trials where axillary de-escalation was done. In the de-escalation arm, the recurrence in axilla is double, although not statistically significant. So ALND still remains the standard of care for most of the patients. However, we should endeavor to spare level 3 selectively. In post-NACT, SLNB is an option in selected group of patients. So T0 to T3, N0 to 1 to begin with. Definitely not for T4 or N2 patients. Dual tracer technique, more than 3 nodes to be removed, 3 or more nodes to be removed, and preferably IHC for detection of isolated tumor cells because even presence of isolated tumor cells would subject them to further axillary surgery. If it is YP, that means after chemotherapy, sentinel node is positive, then we either do axillary node dissection or we can enroll in one of the trials comparing axillary node dissection with radiation therapy. And RT decisions currently should be based on the pre-NSCT staging and not based on post-NSCT. So if the nodes were positive, RT should be administered based on that and not on the post-NACT staging as yet. There are many ongoing trials and we will have results from them to further de-escalate our treatment. And thank you very much for a patient listening. I'll be happy to take any questions if they are there. Thank you, Dr. Vedan. Very nice and crisp presentation. Excellent presentation regarding axillary dissection. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. No, right. So, one important thing in this, uh, which uh, I could make out is that pre NSAT, or rather before starting any treatment, you have to assess the patient properly, and that status will remain as such. And then you start the treatment, and later on, 
depending upon the uh, lymph node status, even the, if the lymph node becomes N0, we have to treat the axilla. Another thing we got is uh, radiation fibrosis regarding uh, treating the axillary area. There is a lot of you and try in the uh, doctors. Why should we go? Should we go for the radiation to axilla or not? If it is involved, we have to go. And edema by uh, of the upper arm is maybe because of many things, not only with the radiation. If the axilla is involved and there is perineural or perivascular invasion of uh, malignant cells, then they are bound to get edema. If there is extensive surgery or extensive radiation, then also they are bound to get upper arm edema. So it should be judiciously used and proper dose will never cause edema. It is uh, only when the axilla is involved. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, any other question from uh, audience? Do you have any other question? I would just like you to summarize uh, like how you treat because he has taught, uh, told a very detail about yeah. the surgery part. That's good. Uh, but I would like you to just summarize for the general audience. Like we have yeah. IMA doctors also. Yeah, he has given a nice, nice summary in the end. Oh. So, and, uh, uh, is, yeah. I'll just give it in a minute again. Right. For, for upfront breast cancer surgery, we for a clinically negative axilla. And clinically negative means you can't palpate any node and you can't see it on ultrasound, any suspicious node. We will subject them to sentinel node biopsy. Very few patients who are postmenopausal, ERPR positive, HER2 negative, and less than two centimeter primary tumor with a very good sonologist saying that there is no suspicious node, we can avoid even doing sentinel lymph node biopsy. Now, coming to sentinel node biopsy, coming positive. If it is micrometastatic disease, that means less than two centimeter deposit in a node, we can leave the axilla. If it is macromet, up to one to two nodes, but Number of nodes removed are larger. So out of maybe two out of four, one out of three, we can leave axilla, take care of it by either radiation or even observation as per some of the time. So this is for upfront surgery. For surgery happening after chemotherapy, if the patient has a negative axilla, clinically negative axilla before chemotherapy, should be subjected to sentinel lymph node biopsy after chemotherapy. If node is positive, whether it is isolated tumor cell, micrometastasis or gross metastasis, axillary node dissection should be done or can be enrolled, enrolled into trials of axillary node dissection versus radiation. For a patient who had N1 neck, that is up to 1 to 3 nodes positive, if they have become clinically N0 after chemotherapy, they can still be subjected to sentinel node biopsy. We must remove at least 3 nodes and use dual tracers and prove that the axilla is negative before we observe. If those patients who have turned clinically negative but pathologically are positive, we have to do axillary research. Now, last group is for those patients who are N2 or N3, that is heavy nodal burden already before chemotherapy, they may have achieved N0 status. Right now, it is not safe to omit axillary dissection. Now, one more point of axillary radiation. If we have dissected the axilla nicely, then the dissected field should not be radiated. Suppose we have dissected level 1 and 2, even if the nodes are positive, but there is no residual disease left behind, you should not radiate level 1 and 2, radiate only level 3 because that has been left. So undissected areas like level 3, and, uh, supraclav, and in some high-risk cases, internal mammary radiation. However, for a good axillary dissection, please don't radiate the operated field. That's, that's the dictum that we follow uh, at our center and then most of the centers. So that will further reduce the axillary fibrosis and uh, post-operative and post-RT lymphedema. And radiation planning now, uh, unfortunately, we have good machines, but the planning is very important. And we should have a good radiation physicist, radiation technologist, because radiation oncologists cannot sit and make the plan. The plans have to be made by them. They will only vet the plan. And I'm sure Dr. Chaturvedi will agree with that, that the planning becomes very important so that you can spare the other organs like lung, heart, and, and any other axillary vessels. Thank you. That's very true. It's the physicist who decides where to and how much doses to deliver. But how to deliver, 
which site is to be delivered that is decided by the radiation oncologist and third part comes the technicians so they will be doing how they are delivering the dose on that so mm -hmm. very nicely explained thank you so much uh, sorry for the interruption. There was a question for Dr. Sneha, ma'am. Ma'am, if you uh, want to explain that answer. Okay. Yeah, I could see the question at, uh, uh, you know, if there is a large fibroadenoma, how would you conceive the patient and relatives? Uh, so first and foremost, uh, for fibroadenoma per se, as far as the diagnosis goes, um, considering the young age and the benign nature clinically for every uh, lump what we apply is the triple uh, algorithm so clinically by history and then imaging and then uh, I mean, uh, history a clinical examination and imaging this is how you have to go for diagnosis once you're sure that it is fibroadenoma there's actually no necessary to become panic but when you're talking about a large fibroadenoma, there are certain guidelines by NICE. So saying that, you know, if you have a fibroadenoma more than five centimeter, then that definitely, you know, deserves excision. And uh, so uh, excision biopsy, you remove and send it for histopathology. That is what we are supposed to advise them. But in exceptional situations, sometimes the patients are not ready for, you know, excision. If it is not very significant, but then uh, you have to go for histopathology. But that is in that case, it is only with core biopsy or true cut biopsy, what we call it as. So large fibroadenoma, go for excision biopsy and histopathological examination confirmation. Once you are sure that the diagnosis is negative for malignancy, you have to. I mean, you have to relax the patient and relatives. That's all. I think uh, that is all from my side. Uh, I'm sure uh, you must have, uh, you know, the query is satisfied already. Thank you so much. I just Thank want to you. add one more point to it. Uh, uh, even with a large fibroidoma, before you decide to excise, do a true cut biopsy, confirm that it is a benign thing because yes. sometimes you end up having malignancy and triple negative tumors are very rounded and may show up as uh, fibroidinoma or they may be phylloid tumor which may need a different kind of manner. Yes. That's the reason we are saying that yes, yeah. biopsy or core biopsy is a mandatory if it is a yeah. very large fibroidinoma. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Vedant, for adding. Thank you so much, both the speakers, Dr. Sneha Bhuyar and Dr. Kalra Kabra. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Deepi so Chaturvedi. You can mm, take thanks over. Thanks all. <laughs> It was my work, my job to say thanks. And uh, thank you, ma'am. You were very brilliant. And thank you, Dr. Cabra. Very informative, exhaustive, and elaborative talk. And we all really enjoyed having a good mind over it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dipti and Dr. A.K. Chaturvedi. Thank you so much. Thank so you. Much. So will you. Yeah. Thank you so okay, much. Bye. Thank you. And wish you success. So, thank you. We are closing the session over here. Thank you and have a nice day to all. Thank you. Thank you.